Welcome everybody. Um, we're pleased that you could be with us today. This is the first of our public webinars, uh, of virtual events presented by the CCA in 2022. Um, we're pleased that all our stakeholders could be here um, from Canada, throughout the Americas, and increasingly uh, more so in Europe as well. Um, we have a full slate of events this year that we will be announcing as we go forward. And I know many of you well, hopefully all of you received the announcements. Uh, and if you haven't been receiving them regularly, please let us know at ccacanada.com and we'll make sure that you get on our mailing list. We'll be doing a, a number of exciting things this year, or at least we, we think that they are. Um, a, a few housekeeping events before we start today's show is the next public event that we'll be doing is on January 20th. And it's entitled, We Once Held These Truths Canada and Ibero-America face the U.S. precipice. Um, this is an event we're very excited about, and, and the pre-registration numbers would indicate that the many people in the world are excited about uh, this topic and this event. The panelists will be Dave Walmsley, who's the editor-in-chief of The Globe and Mail in Toronto, Christina Manzano, who's director of ESG Global in Madrid, and a columnist for El País, uh, Juan Pardinas, who's the dire uh, director general, uh, editor-in-chief of Reforma in Mexico, and Doug Sanders, who is the international affairs columnist for the Globe and Mail, and formerly head of its bureau in London and in Los Angeles. Uh, as all our public events, it, it's complimentary registration at ccacanada.com. We will be announcing more events, as I said earlier, over, uh, over the course of the year and, and in the upcoming days and weeks. Um, and we certainly, for those who've been watching, will know that we're following very, very closely what's going on in Colombia and Chile, and we will be continuing. We've already done 11 episodes of our Looking for the Center of Colombia series, uh, and we will be continuing and picking that up with uh, more events to be announced shortly, as we are with the political developments in Chile and the Constitutional uh, Convention. Okay, so for, for a couple of housekeeping matters for today's show. We will be pleased to take written questions as we always do. And we will do our best to integrate them into the conversation, which maybe sometimes we always don't do as well as we should, but we will try. Um, if you have a question, please don't put it in the chat box. Please put it in the question and answer box, which you see at the bottom of the panel uh, on your screen. Uh, please make them short uh, and please make them in the form of a question. Um, we, you know, we will look at diatribes, but they're usually not, while sometimes entertaining, usually not all that useful. Uh, so if you could reach, uh, restrain yourselves from those, that would, uh, that would be better for us. Uh, the event will be recorded uh, and will be posted on our website no later than tomorrow. Uh, and the event, uh, I think goes without saying, is on the record. Uh, we have, we welcome a number of people from the international press who are with us today. Um, about today's event, we've, div dis we've divided the event into roughly seven sections, starting with international, political, and economic circumstances. Then we move to uh, economic and political circumstances at the regional level. We will then do country by country analysis. Not all countries will be covered, uh, but uh, all the main, quote, major ones will be. Um, we will then, as a penultimate section, talk about business opportunities, given everything that we discussed uh, preceding, and we will finish with a round of the panelists on potential black swans for 2022. Um, today's panelists uh, will be familiar to our longtime aficionados of, of this annual program. Uh, as I say, it's, it's now in our 12th year. Um, and, they, and they are uh, Jonathan Hausman, Senior Managing Director for Global Investment Strategy at Ontario's P Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, who is also Chairman of the Board of the, of the CCA. Jonathan's based in Toronto. We have Fiona Mackey, Director for Latin America and the Caribbean at the Economist Intelligence Unit based in London. John Price, Managing Director at America's Market Intelligence based in Miami. John is also a board member of the Canadian Council for the Americas. Eduardo Suarez, Vice President for Latin American Economics, Ec Latin American Economics 
at Scotiabank. Eduardo's based in Mexico City, and we're honored to have them all back with us here. But we're particularly uh, pleased to have Elena Lazaro with, with us for the first time. Elena is acting head of external policies at the European Research Service and associate fellow at Chatham House. Elena is based in Brussels. Elena, a particular welcome to you and a particular thank you to you for being with us uh, today. So with uh, those housekeeping matters out of the way and the introductions, let's start off talking a bit about where Latin America is situated uh, economically in the international structure. Jonathan, you wanna start with, start with us? Sure, Ken, thanks very much. And uh, I, as chair, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to this event. Um, I'll be speaking in my capacity as chair of the Canadian Council for the Americas for the event today. Um, it's a really uh, pivotal time to be talking about the overall economic landscape. Um, uh, globally in which Latin America resides. Um, maybe three things I'd like to talk about. The first is um, at a very high level of aggregation, um, we are in a COVID economy. So the global economy has been, just, has been deeply affected and for a long time by the pandemic and more importantly, by the response to it. So, the paradigm shift that was already probably in train before the pandemic emerged has now been accelerated like many things by the pandemic uh, to, and, and a paradigm shift in uh, global economics that's really quite uh, profound. Uh, we were in a paradigm previously of low inflation, relatively high levels of growth, quite a bit of volatility, but very, very significant returns to investors. Uh, for a very long period of time. We, are, we have entered and now accelerated into a paradigm of higher inflation, uh, lower returns to investors, uh, still a quite a bit of volatility, and uh, most importantly, a big focus on inequality and, and thus distributive uh, justice um, has, be, has come straight to the forefront. That implies a number of things that are very relevant to Latin America uh, and to the Caribbean. And that is, uh, we have a different paradigm in terms of what we can expect in relation to the uh, monetary policy, uh, particularly in the big countries with influential central banks, starting with the United States, a normalization or renormalization of rates. And um, we just had a print, as you will probably all know, of 7% in the United States in inflation. That is an astounding number. And it is not transitory. It wasn't really transitory even when they said it was transitory. Um, but um, now it, I think everyone agrees. And I think um, Mr. Powell has, has uh, put his mind straight on the topic of how to address this very significant change that's taking place. What does that mean for Latin America? I think we know what it means that capital flows um, begin to be much more fussy about returns. And when you're earning higher and higher returns in the US, say, um, with a very strong economic constitution and a very um, a very powerful capital market with lots of attractive uh, opportunities that makes it much harder for a country in Latin America to compete. The second thing it means is that um, in addition to the capital flow question is I want to talk about another dimension about the COVID economy and that is trade flows and the flows of foreign direct investment. One of the things that has occurred is a spanner in the works of a highly integrated globalized economy. So you could really say that another element of that paradigm shift is from globalization to a process of some, maybe not uh, catastrophic, but certainly uh, noticeable deglobalization. And again, the pandemic has accelerated that. How? There are container ships that are in China that should be in California and vice versa, and they're not going back and forth like they used to. And you, could, you can trace um, many, many of the supply shocks and the supply chain disruptions that right back to policies of how to address the, um, the pandemic. Uh, China has taken a zero uh, tolerance approach to COVID. That means lots of disruption in the ports, lots of disruptions in the internal uh, transport of, of, of supplies that we're waiting for, chips, et cetera. Though that seems to be easing some. And the United States, a very different approach. So we've got a lack of global coordination and a lack of global coherence in terms of our economic relationships. That's not good for LATAM uh, because what we need is a really healthy and free-flowing trading system, and that system has been disrupted. Last point, 
Um, we are also living through, I wouldn't say this is a really a COVID phenomenon, although it has highlighted it, um, the, a world of climate change. And that world um, generates um, lots and lots of focus on the supply side uh, to change the mix of our energy and, and what have you. Uh, uh, it, uh, as you'd expect, if you're trying to raise the price of fossil fuels because uh, you think that their externalities are not being fully internalized, well, that's exactly what's happened. Plus, the capital has not been flowing to the supply side. And as, but the demand side is doing great because people are getting checks in the mail to, and they don't know what to spend it on. And so what you have is a um, inflationary impact. We talked about that. But what you also have is a very, what should be a very healthy environment for the commodity exporting countries of Latin America, Brazil, Colombia, et cetera, whether, it, whether it's in energy or whether it's in food, et cetera, but particularly in energy and in minerals. And indeed, the prices um, of oil and copper, et cetera, up in, are at, at um, medium term highs. But you're not seeing it in the quality and the strength of those currencies. And that is a very important signal that something is wrong. And what's wrong is you have um, the, the classical concerns around fiscal stability and the um, overall uh, welcome, welcoming nature of these countries to foreign capital because of whether it's populism of the right, populism of the left. And that's something I think we should talk about in this session as we go on, but it has real economic impacts. Uh, the, the, the Brazilian rail, for example, is trading between five and a half and six, and really based on the price of oil and the price of these commodities, it should be trading quite a bit better. So uh, let me leave it there, Ken. Uh, lots, lots of stuff to dig into, but once again, welcome and um, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Fiona and I think John Price both want to jump in. Fiona, you want to start uh, and then we'll go to John? Sure. I just want to talk a little bit about the US and China in more detail because um, it's slightly stating the obvious, but what happens in the US and China is vital to what happens in Latin America. And I think that we saw that very clearly in 2021 when Latin America sort of registered a much more robust economic recovery than the markets were expecting. And that was driven by sort of real sort of a stimulus from the US and also strong import demand from China. And I think the situation is changing as we go into 2022. I think, though, from the from the growth perspective, the outlook for the U.S. and China is not unsupportive. So, for example, we expect for U.S. economic growth to remain above trend in 2022. And although we won't have those stimulus checks that will feed so quickly and thoroughly through to remittances for Latin America, we will have some stimulus in the form, for example, of the infrastructure bill that was passed. And that might sort of boost construction and boost remittances in that way. And overall, the picture for US economic growth is relatively is relatively bright for 2022. And then and also in China, although we do expect the economy to slow, uh, we actually expect for there to be a moderate rate of economic growth. And I think the most important thing to understand about China is that um, if there's one indicator that you should look at, um, if you want to know how China's economy uh, affects Latin America, it's not GDP, it's certainly import demand. There's a very strong correlation between Latin America's export performance and its overall economic performance and uh, Chinese import demand. And there are some structural factors that suggest that Chinese import demand will be high uh, out into the medium term and certainly in 2022. And those factors are a front loading of imports related to China's self-sufficiency drive. Um, and also front loading of imports related to the fact that uh, China wants to get those imports in before it has to meet its uh, carbon reduction commitments in 2025 and 2030. And all of that means that the sort of the commodity picture is, is relatively bright. As Jonathan says, you know, a lot of that is being driven by clean energy. So that means that maybe the outlook for copper, we expect it to continue to rise in 2022, whereas oil might fall off some of those highs, but generally still sort of a solid picture from that, from that growth perspective perspective. However, you know, there are big caveats there. And one is that very large risk to the Chinese economy from its zero COVID policy, if we see, you know, new variants, and uh, that that in the light of that zero COVID policy caused Chinese import demand to fall substantially. So that's a big risk for Latin America. And then of course, as, as, as Jonathan set out, sort of the, the big shift 
the for emerging markets and Latin America is US monetary policy normalization. And what that means, even though we know that that's coming and we've known for a while and central banks in Latin America have responded to that and tried to get ahead of that. Um, what that means is we might have even more currency pressures, even though most currencies, as Jonathan says, are, are pretty dramatically undervalued in Latin America already. So we'll have more uh, sort of inflationary pressures if we have pass through, uh, more pressure for monetary tightening, which will dampen the economic recovery in Latin America, it will also put, and I think this is really important to understand, more creditworthiness uh, pressures on Latin American sovereigns than we've seen to date. So we didn't really see pressures in 2020 or 2021, but 2022 is a year because of what's happening in the U.S. with monetary policy, where we expect to see some of those creditworthiness concerns as domestic debt service costs rise really come to the fore. And that's one reason why uh, we are forecasting that Latin America will unfortunately be the slowest growing region in the world this year, having been the fastest growing region in 2021. Okay, now I know Fiona, you wanted to jump in and say something, but let, we'll go to John and then we'll come to you, Elena, okay? Thanks, John, Ken. Please. I have more of a question than a comment. Um, so between 2020 and 2021, about over about an 18 month period, the, the biggest central banks in the world expanded the, the money base by 22%, <clears throat> which should cause a lot of inflation if people start spending that money. Um, in my entire sort of adult history, I've never lived in a high inflationary period from a sort of North American or European perspective. And for the same reason, none of the currency traders in New York or London or anywhere else, um, whether they're trading volatile, mature currencies like the Canadian dollar or volatile emerging market currencies, none of them have had any experience with uh, high inflation in the United States or Europe. And so, as Fiona points out, we're moving towards normalization. Um, before COVID, any, a, a quarter point or half point movement in any major central bank would cause uh, a, a maelstrom in emerging markets. So how do you, for those who can answer it, how do you see this dynamic of people unaware of how to deal with, say, eight or 9% US inflation and rising interest rates, but still well below that inflation level, uh, even if inflation stops at 6%, uh, which it is today, um, how, how is the market, how are the traders of, of emerging market currencies going to react over the next year in this high headline inflation and rising interest environment? Are they gonna see it as a dovish position by central banks in the US and Europe, or is it gonna be considered you know, uh, hawkish? Okay, thanks, John. Um, I don't know if anybody on the panel wanted to address that question at this point. Eduardo, did you want to did you want to say something about that? I think an interesting point on the on this front will be uh, from emerging market themselves, uh, and and it's, it's a question I think uh, some of our policymakers somewhat answered in the past. Uh, Cars. Carson, when he was in the Central Bank of Mexico, very often uh, referred to relative monetary conditions. Uh, and I think the, the degree of, in which central banks in, in Latin America are able to, to anticipate those moves in the Fed and keep that spread at levels uh, that keep their currency stable will be very important. Uh, the second factor, which I think will be very important in which countries can survive this shock and which ones can't, uh, will be the credibility of the central banks. Uh, one of the things which I think is very interesting when you look at emerging market markets, is that the countries that have interest rates of 20, 30, 40% don't come from credit premium. A country that's about to go into default will usually have their CDS trading, let's say 6,000, 8,000 basis points. So that means you add six to eight points to the interest rate of a country that has a credit risk. When you look at the countries where interest rates go to 50, 60, 70, 80, you're usually looking at countries that don't have credible and autonomous central bank. And in that regard, I think Latin America uh, is and like much of the emerging world, uh, clearly has almost like three baskets. You have countries with strong credibility where the central banks are autonomous and which usually are able, I think would almost universally, are able to keep their interest rates uh, in a range of say four to 10%. Then you have a second basket of countries which are shaken, uh, which are closer to 10 to 20. And then you have the basket cases. Uh, and I think that that's gonna be one of the things that, uh, is different this time around than, than maybe in the past. And the other one, which is really important, and I think uh, 
policymakers in some countries are underestimating the strength it gives them is having domestic savings pools. It's not only because having domestic fully funded pension funds means you have an anchor for, for, for being able to, to finance yourself, but it also gives a buyer of last resort, which also helps to reassure global investors. So I think, again, we have countries in the region which are well positioned for this kind of change in, in paradigm, which John referred to, and countries which are much less well placed. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, we're already running up against a lot of time for this, but Elena, you you have a double shot. I know you wanted to come in on this one on uh, comment on Fiona's comment, and then we'll turn to you to talk, please, about where Latin America is situated politically in the world. Thank you, Ken, and, and that's good because I was about to start by saying I'm afraid I'm going to have a comment that takes us a bit to the political direction or rather it takes it out of the economic uh, realm because I, I'm not an economist, uh, but perhaps that's a good thing because we'll feed into the next panel. But what I what I had as a comment to, to Fiona's comments, which I completely agree from from my non economist layperson's understanding of them is uh, two more th two more risks that I see in terms of of, of, of potentially affecting growth and uh, uh, export induced growth. Uh, the one was mentioned by Fiona, and it's the possibility of China going into very strict lockdowns and reduced demand, uh, obviously, uh, which is a possibility. But with regard to the two other major investors and importers from the region, which are the European Union and the United States, what I see is that on the one hand, we have a huge demand for, for products that Latin America produces in abundance and agricultural, but also, you know, rum and um, uh, natural resources and minerals, etc. But at the same time, there's a very strong regulatory trend in both Europe and the US to, to condition imports on, on due diligence, on, on a labor, uh, labor right, respect for labor rights, uh, environmental provisions, etc. So if the region doesn't adapt its manufacturing or its production, its production methods to that, it, there may be an issue with, with increasing exports of products that are in demand. And I, I see this very much from Brussels where I am, for example, with regard to Brazil, uh, major products that are needed and important from Brazil, uh, like soya and beef, um, soy and beef and cellulose, for, uh, which are related to deforestation, there's going to be a big discussion about to what degree those can be imported uh, if they are linked to deforestation. So I think on the, we have the paradox. We have commodities that are needed, but we also have a trend in, in, in sort of what we call the big democracies to, to really condition those upon methods of production that at times are not taking place in Latin America. So that may be a risk. And, and the second, I think, which will impact growth um, is that COVID has sort of given a laissez-faire or laissez-passer with regard to expansionary monetary policy and also, you know, very big social spending and welfare spending, which, which publics and populations have gotten used to in Latin America. So governments will be very reluctant to change their approach to that in light of major elections coming up. So, so the spending may be huge because people will be even more frustrated having gotten used to this kind of uh, handouts uh, if they're cut right before an election. So I think that's really jeopardizing the possibilities for growth, even if an environment is in generally in favor. So that was my comment to Fiona. I can move to, to what you wanted. Yeah, in you can take a deep, deep now. breath and we'll go to the next section. There you go. I'm taking a breath. I also <laughs> say thank you at this point, because now it's it's my official time to speak. So thank you for the invitation. <laughs> and also to say that I am uh, speaking in my capacity as an associate fellow at uh, Chatham House and for this session. So I'm in no way representing the, the European Parliament or its uh, its services. Um, so I, I think we've already touched upon the, the international politics in many of because of course US China has already been mentioned, which I think is the great trend that characterizes uh, what we're seeing today in the international political environment. And, and in many ways, it's very hard to dis, de, disassociate the international politics and the geopolitics from the economics as we've moved into this era of geoeconomics or geotechnology. Everything is geo. And, and, and you know, it's, 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 it's very standard to say COVID has exacerbated this trend. And it's true, actually. So that's why we are saying trends that existed are there. I think we're seeing four or five major trends in, in global in international politics and geopolitics. Obviously, one is this antagonism between the US and China, which manifests itself on several levels. Uh, obviously, trade is one of them in economics, but I would say also uh, it's really reinforced uh, this idea of, of that the United States and, and its allies, and there I put Europe as well, and I keep talking about China, Europe, and the US as major sources of investment and trade with Latin America. So human rights and democracy versus the authoritarian paradigm have also become key parts of, of the way that 
all the, that Europe and the US are approaching the region vis-a-vis uh, -vis and juxtaposed to what China is doing. And I think this is a really big trend that affects the region. The second, I think, is the green and environmental uh, trends uh, that are part of international politics everywhere. And we'll be seeing more, more rollouts of that kind of regulation and approaches informed by that in all areas of policy by major actors. And that one as well relevant to, to, to Latin America in the sense that it actually offers a very opportune ground for investment in these areas um, with the you know, green hydrogen and all the, the types of um, uh, renewable energy uh, markets it offers. So, so, so that's an opportunity, but at the same time jeopardized by the fact that investors um, perceive polit politics and as unstable in the region. And then I think that that creates a lot of, of reluctance, whereas the region is really uh, offering itself for that in the context of also, you know, ESG and various other types of taxonomies for, for investment. Third trend is the digital one, digital infrastructure as well. Uh, that's also dominating international politics. And there's a lot of investment from major sort of sources of, of funding for financing, for, for building up digital infrastructure. And, and that is, it sounds like an economic trend, but it's also a geopolitical one because it also has to do with, with, with ways to, to, to counter um, foreign influence, uh, cyber issues, etc. And, and again, we have initiatives by the Biden administration, the Europeans on the global gateways, but also, of course, the BRI. And I think that plays out in that theater of Latin America as well. So, so it is very relevant. And we're seeing the various debates in the various countries of the region. Um, and then, of course, um, supply chains, and particularly those supply chains of critical raw materials and lithium key amongst them because of, well, we know Argentina, um, Bolivia, Chile being big providers of that, and 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 again the the sort of global uh, race to to secure those because of all the electric uh, and various other uh, electric cars, but also other other chip microchips and everything that has become even more relevant under COVID. But I would argue was also already there as part of 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 the global competition for powermanship. So that's really part of, of the international politics of it all. Uh, and finally, of course, and that's uh, the classic and it never changes the democracy, human rights and equality issues, which are very normative issues. But I think I would argue have become more pronounced right now in international politics because those multilateral organizations that are there to secure and guarantee a sort of universalism of those perhaps arguably are really now being affected by this antagonism between the US and China. And obviously that has led to the questioning of those multilateral institutions to, to, to really the seeping into various aspects of international politics. So I've tried to feed into how all this affects the region and its relations with the world, but I'm very happy to go back to it um, after these initial comments. Very, very well done. Thank you, Elena. Fiona, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, first, just to say that I completely agree with Elena that I think that um, ESG issues are going to be of fundamental importance uh, for the, you know globally and for for Latin America going forwards. And as Elena says, that sort of presents uh, opportunities and risks. So the risk of disinvestment, disinvestment, but also opportunities for investment, not only in projects, but I would say for sovereigns that are in need of finance at the moment, there is a huge demand on the part of portfolio investors uh, for uh, ESG debt instruments. And at the moment, Latin America accounts for less than 5% of the global total of those instruments. So those are developing and becoming more sophisticated. And there's potentially the opportunity for Latin America, if it can commit to those ESG criteria to take advantage of that money that will be on the table. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to mention was around sort of the US-China great power rivalry. And that's something that is going to be sort of the great sort of geopolitical issue of, of coming, not just this decade, but of coming decades. I think uh, actually in terms of um, uh, the U.S.'s response and the U.S.'s relationship with Latin America, it just bears mentioning that we have actually seen now signs, uh, more signs from the Biden administration um, done in a multilateral way through the Build Back Better World Initiative, which includes not just the U.S., but the G7, sort of a new sort of, it is not sort of the sort of threat that we saw during the Trump administration for Latin American governments not to associate with China, but really offering a sort of an alternative in the financing sphere for Latin American governments with sort of potentially something to rival the BRI that the U.S. states sort of is better uh, uh, sort of uh, 
better constructed in terms of transparency, corruption, um, and labor and environmental standards, and actually sort of target the different areas. So where the BRI might target energy and transport infrastructure, this is sort of supposed to target sort of issues that are increasingly important to Latin America. So health, um, climate, uh, gover governance, and, and digital technology. So, I, I mean, I don't expect this to be a, a real revolution. And I think we're talking about a real trickle of investment rather than a flood, at least in the next year or two. But I think it's a good starting point for a new engagement with the US in G7 with Latin America. And I think it's good to see that, you know, the US under Biden now appears to be paying attention to Latin America. And I think that although, the, you know, sort of managing between the US and China is, is really, you know, is really complicated and difficult in, uh, in some instances for Latin American governments, now is also potentially an opportunity to extract concessions from the US government um, because of that uh, great power competition. Thank you, Fiona. Jonathan, one concluding remarks to this se uh, section? Yeah, I, I just wanted to maybe pick up on and amplify a couple of points that Fiona made, which I think were dead on. The, the first is um, more of a tactical point and the second is more of a strategic one. The tactical one is um, there are real opportunities, dipl diplomatically speaking, uh, right now but, uh, on a continental basis. Um, so it, it's it's a that's a matter of empirical fact that the vaccines that are um, being produced in the United States and in Europe are a lot more effective against um, COVID than are the ones produced in China. Uh, I, that that's an empirical fact. It also creates a diplomatic opportunity in terms of vaccine diplomacy, and I actually think that given the fact that the world um, is being increasingly divided between those who um, want to um, uh, adhere to um, their continental identity and to a global identity. I think it's a real opportunity for the United States and Europe in Latin America to bring Latin America closer in. And there's a lot of goodwill that is associated. Um, and of course, in the, in, the, in the case of Brazil, that's actually a commercial opportunity to produce vaccines like the commercial opportunity that India, India has found um, to produce vaccines. The more strategic point is um, really this broader point that Fiona has introduced around the economic bifurcation of the globe. And uh, here I want to talk about technology. So some of the more interesting opportunities in um, uh, technology, particularly in fintechs, but also in other areas are in Latin America. They are about 15 years behind where the United States was. Uh, John Price in the last um, uh, session last year made, made a point of this, I think is absolutely correct. And now we're beginning to see that really um, come to the fore with companies that are um, unicorns that are being essentially generated in Mexico and Brazil and, uh, and other countries as well. And I think that is being accelerated and will be deepened by the, the sheer fact that there is a technological bifurcation or iron um, you know, veil that has been uh, placed to, uh, between China platform and the US uh, platform. There's some complicating features because given that Italy's on one side and, you know, it, it's not totally the way it was as we think about the Cold War, but nonetheless, it is dividing the world. And LATAM has the population, uh, an incredible desire to be online. And Brazil, I think, is the most desirous being online of any population on the planet except Israel. So, you know, that, that is a real uh, possibility here for investors. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. We'll allow John to take a victory lap in a second. Uh, but first, we'll, we'll move now from the international to the regional and specifically regional economics. Eduardo, can you start us off, please? You're on mute, Eduardo. You're on mute, Eduardo. Sorry. There you go. I'd like to make two quick points on how I, I think of uh, Latin American economics going forward. And, and the first one is a little bit related to the topic we had on politics. Uh, Latin America has had a, almost like a 20 year cycle, 30 year cycle in which it goes through a, almost like a soul searching of what is economic model is going to be going forward. We had the export substitution, then we had the more kind of free market cycle. And now again, it's all being questioned. Um, they're yet relatively young, uh, young countries. I think they haven't really found a consensus on, on what they are like, almost like their economic identity is. Um, and in that regard, uh, some of the debate I think is encouraging. We have countries like, for example, Chile right now, which are debating how the, the social, uh, social security uh, framework will work. And I think in that regard, uh, looking towards Canada would be a fantastic solution for, for, for Latin America in understanding how this uh, almost soul searching on their, on their economic and political models goes, goes forward. Because even though Canada is often referred to somewhat as a 
more socialist country. I think in some ways it's a more cap a pure capitalist country than even the US in the sense that the way the Canadian social security is created, it's, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a system that puts a, a young workers just starting their careers at the capacity to compete very uh, evenly with each other through the public education, health, all those things. And in that regard, it allows for, for competition to truly uh, allow, uh, determine a person's outcome rather than whether they were born with golden diapers or, or newspaper ones. And in that regard, uh, I think this soul searching by Latin America is a huge opportunity, but it's also something that can be, uh, again, gotten wrong, which would, again, in 30 years, lead to another round of, of, of soul searching. So I think it's a very interesting, almost branch. In, in Latin America that we've seen. The second one has to go has to do with is Latin America positioned for the new economy. I, I think in some regards it's it's a little bit underestimated. Latin America has had a very kind of strong staying power of the global middle class because its traditional economies have to some degree uh, translate into new ones. I, I think in the, in this case again it, it's true. Uh, uh, even mining, some parts of mining are fading, but again many of these mining products are are vital to the new economy. Not only the lithium, which is very well documented, but iron ore is one of the new technologies coming out for, for batteries. So many of the mining industries in Latin America are crucial to the next leg of the world economy. We have a, just today, one of our, the CEOs of one of our competitors in Canada was, was saying that a, North America has a massive scarcity of talent and a competition for talent who are prepared for, for mathematics and engineering. Uh, if you look at the, the countries in the, in the planet that produce the most engineers, Mexico's number seven. Uh, uh, and and th that same thing that created Mexico's manufacturing power can translate and is translating into, into fintech. Uh, and again, at a point I made last year, uh, a, a big question, a relevant one is, uh, you don't necessarily have to drive a new industry. Uh, I think there's three ways to, three, three seats you, have, you can have in the bus. You can be driving it, and that will mean you're producing the next Teslas. You can be a passenger in the bus, you will be manufacturing uh, the, the new product, be digital traditional, or you can just see it go by. Sadly, there's some countries, uh, I think for example, some of the poor countries in Central America or, or the Caribbean that may not have the market size and may not have the, the infrastructure and the, and the, and the skill set to, to be passengers in the bus. But I think countries like Brazil, Mexico, and, and, and the Indians are certainly well positioned to, to be at least passengers and in some cases drivers. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, John, um, I don't know if you want to pick up on Eduardo's diaper metaphor uh, and or go into something else, but the floor is yours. There's a lot between diapers and uh, 30 year panorama. No, um, that was, as always, Eduardo, that was a masterful and very strategic look at the region's economies. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reduce it down to more of a two, three year window and just talk about how disruptive COVID was in Latin America, because ironically with people traveling much less than they have today, there's an even greater misunderstanding of just the degree to which it, was, it has been disruptive in Latin America. And uh, let me throw some stats out at you. Um, still today, now basically almost two years after the start of COVID, 75% of Latin Americans are still worse off than they were pre-COVID. The, the U.S. is 20%. So in other words, in the U.S., 80% of Americans are where they were pre-COVID or better. In Latin America, it's the, it's the reverse. It's a small minority, 20, 25% who are at where they were in 2019 or better off. Um, the distribution of income in Latin America, um, which is steadily improved actually over 30 years with a few hiccups along the way, um, lost 15 years of progress in six months of lockdowns. Um, and so if your business model relies upon a mass market, uh, the purchasing power of your middle-class consumer in Latin America is still not where it was pre-COVID. Um, I share Eduardo's enthusiasm in certain areas like FinTech where there continues to be tremendous amount of venture capital investment going into Latin America and, and the creation of, of some really novel businesses, particularly in larger markets that, that can sustain a good size, scalable business like Mexico and Brazil. But nonetheless, if you look at the companies around the world that grew their market cap in 2020 uh, the most, 
99 out of 100 are outside of Latin America. Only Mercado Libre was in that top 100. And if you look at the top, say, 500 companies in Latin America, um, like America Economia's list, and you look at what industries they tend to be clustered in, they're the very industries that suffer the most, traditional retail, automotive sales. Um, and, and so Latin America, the, the, dis, the disruption by industry, which is probably the greatest disruption globally that we've seen economically out of COVID, Latin America did not do well and has not done well. Socially, economically, because of the limited ability to move money to the poor, even though there was some pretty honorable uh, efforts in Brazil, Peru, and Chile, nonetheless, we see this terrible disruption. Why? Because 60% of Latin Americans work informally. And so when a 30-year-old bureaucrat tells him to stop working because infection levels have reached a certain level, his or her income goes from 100 to zero overnight, while that 30-year-old bureaucrat keeps getting a full paycheck working from home on Zoom, which I... I'm, I'm giving a little bit of a hint as to why there's such political rancor in Latin America today. But this economic disruption is, is, is real. Uh, on, the, on the plus side, e-commerce is growing at 30% a year in Latin America. And, and, and it doesn't matter what business you're in, if you're talking to consumers, you have to be a part of that change. And that for a lot of Latin American companies is new and has opened the door for even more dominance in certain technological fields by global companies. Because they already had the tools in place and it was just a matter of moving across borders. So this economic disruption has um, uh, on the, generally been a negative for Latin America, although there's lots of bright areas. You've talked about money, you've talked about fintech, you talk about e-commerce, but generally speaking, there's a very good reason why Latin America had the low, you know, has such a low growth um, uh, forecast this year. It's because they took such a big hit uh, in terms of investment flows, in terms of startups, in terms of um, business continuation. Thanks, John. Fiona? I just wanted to make a brief comment that really touches on things that uh, John, Eduardo, and Elena uh, at the beginning of the session all, all touched on, and that's this idea of the sort of lopsided and incomplete recovery. And I think that actually this is going to lead to what I think is going to be the biggest sort of economic, social, and political issue for Latin America over the next couple of years. And that is the pressure on the one hand from the market uh, for consolidation and, and macro policy tightening and pressure from voters on the other hand, who are saying, you know, it, headline GDP might suggest that we've recovered to pre-pandemic levels, but for example, em employment has not, and we're still suffering and we need more support, particularly if there is over the course of 2022, as there well might be another uh, potentially more virulent COVID variant. Uh, so you have this sort of, uh, uh, you have this sort of conflict between the market and what voters are actually demanding. And that's very, going to be very, very difficult um, dilemma for, for governments to resolve. And I think it's going to have policy implications around tax, regulation, labor market. And I think it's gonna have political implications as well. Thank you, Fiona. Elena. Just a tiny comment because you had the group food security into this category and uh, and I've been doing a bit of foresight work lately and and I just wanted to 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 highlight in this in this session on sort of the regional economic dimension that in fact covid has there was before acute quite severe food insecurity in the region but the covid years have really accentuated that and there is extremely high level of uh, child malnutrition in Latin America now compared to a few years ago. And I say this because looking forward, what happens in a country which has, or in countries which have a high degree of food insecurity and childhood malnutrition is that fast forward 10, 15 years, you have several adults with health issues. And that's a huge, huge burden on, on, on the health systems. And that's not, so it's not just a humanitarian issue to address at the moment, but it's also a will eventually, or if it, if, if it has not started yet to do so, affect the health systems in those countries of the region, which are already a huge source of both public spending, but also of political instability because several protests are fueled by demand for more, more public spending on health. So I just wanna bring in this food security issue as a one dimension that I think should, be looked at and should constantly be, be explored more with regard to, to what's happening in the region 
um, in, in the past couple of years, because it's really a social issue, but it's also an economic issue in the long term. Yeah, it's, and I can say sitting in Colombia at the moment, the, the overwhelming complaints on the cost of food right now uh, which initially had uh, the government had said it was due to the paro that had the strikes that had gone on, um, but that ironed out after one quarter. Uh, they haven't gone down again, so there you hear that is a very common refrain now. Um, it's actually quite astounding how uh, expensive some food has gotten in Colombia. Um, with that, let's move to the section on regional politics. Uh, Fiona, do you want to start us off, please? Uh, sure. So um, one thing that we were thinking about is whether or not there has been a paradigm shift and whether there's something that we could call sort of post-COVID politics. And I absolutely think that that there is. And I think there is a difference between what, what happened before and, and what, what comes after. Um, and I think, you know, the first thing that I would say is I generally would always try to avoid generalizations politically about sort of Latin America and it's, for example, it's shift to the left or it's shift to the right. And, uh, you know, I don't think, for example, in the past saying, saying something about the, the pink tide was particularly sort of meaningful. Um, but I do, but I do think sort of in the current environment that that it is meaningful. And I think that it's different from what we saw in Latin America in say 2018 and 2019, which I think which, which we saw with all of those sort of uh, big shifts at the ballot box in 2018 and in 2019 in the form of social unrest. For me, that was more of a throw them all out, anti-incumbency wave. And we were very careful, you know, at the EIU to say this isn't a shift to the left or to the right, this is anti-incumbency. But I actually think that what has happened in the light of COVID is that voter demands are shifting in a significant way. And, and in my view, they're shifting to the left. And so it is, you know, it is fair to talk about a shift to the left in Latin America. And by that, I mean that voters are demanding more from their governments. They're demanding more in the way of fiscal support for longer, for at least as long as the pandemic lasts. But more broadly, they're asking for more regulation on the part of uh, on the part of government and potentially greater sort of participation from the state in the economy altogether. And I think if you take sort of those things that voters are, are asking for, that that sort of those policies seem to be best represented by the left. So I think it's fair to say that uh, that politics in Latin America is shifting to the left. And I think that that has significant implications for, for policymaking uh, in terms of um, the business environment, um, regulation in various sectors like mining, um, the tax outlook, and what's going to happen in terms of labor market regulation, whether it will be looser or in fact, whether it will be tighter. I would say there are a couple of caveats there. Does left versus right tell you everything that you need to know about what's happening in Latin American politics? Absolutely not. So there's a lot of other sort of fault lines and divides in Latin American politics. So sort of a big one is obviously sort of populist versus institutionalist, authoritarian versus Democrat, insider versus outsider, this whole outsider politics thing hasn't, go, hasn't gone away, maybe say open versus closed from a, from a trade angle. So there are a lot of different sort of ways in which you can analyze Latin American politics and how those sort of different fault lines interact. So there's a big difference, for example, between a left-wing populist and a left-wing institutionalist and a right-wing populist. But I do think that those are sort of some ways in which it can be useful to try to understand Latin American politics and where it might go. I think it's quite useful to think about that in terms of what might happen in elections in 2022 in Colombia and Brazil, but certainly what might happen in uh, this year and in the medium term in terms of policy. I think the other thing that I would say in terms of the caveat is, you know, when I talk about the left uh, with the election of Boric in Chile, there's this idea that there's a new left and the old left and someone like Boric uh, represents a more progressive left that's more interested in uh, LGBTQ issues, that's more interested in the environment. And I think that those issues are going to become because we have seen sort of this group of younger voters uh, on the progressive left that are more interested in these issues. I think that we're sort of reaching this critical momentum for these issues to become more important in Latin America. And, you know, for example, we see that in Colombia where the environment isn't, say, the number one issue in the political race, but it is a significant issue and it is something, for example, that Petro is campaigning on. So I think those are sort of, sort of some of those new uh, political issues that are emerging, maybe not because of COVID, but at the same time as COVID. And it sort of 
blending into sort of a very different atmosphere than, than maybe we felt a couple of years ago. Thanks, Fiona. Elena, I wanted you to comment on this, but Fiona, the question I have is, yeah, um, given that your uh, position, I mean, how would you account for the loss of the left in the congressional election, elections in Argentina, uh, the victory of Lasso in Ecuador, and um, the fact that Jadue, the further left in Chile, was defeated by Boric in a huge surprise. Nobody expected that. And the fact that also in Chile, Boric is running against uh, extreme right wing uh, candidate. I mean, that would tend to push back the the idea that there's some sort of a trend moving left, no? Or or you think those are that's sort of too fine a gloss on what's going on? Uh, you know, it's a rule, and I don't think that those are exceptions to a rule. And I think what we've seen also is a lot of political polarization in the region. So there are really big issues on which Latin Americans as uh, people all over the world are divided. And that's what that's created is more political polarization, uh, whether that's on a sort of a left versus right uh, uh, spectrum or whether that's on other issues. So I think there are a lot of other issues at, at, at play, but I think certainly when it comes to what voters want from their governments, that tends to be what we're seeing. It doesn't mean that every left wing candidate will win, certainly not what I'm saying, but it could affect elections and it could, well, I think it will affect policy, whether you're on the right or the left, even a, a centrist candidate or a center right candidate is actually going to try to address the issue. For example, uh, well, I was gonna say in Chile, but throughout Latin America of the lack of a proper social safety net. Th those are going to become issues that are traditional left-wing issues that all politicians are really going to have to sort of set out a position on, which is not to say all politicians will actually want to implement that. But I think that those are issues that we have to recognize are of increasing importance as Latin Americans and people around the world demand more of a social safety net and more of a welfare state. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Elena, I know you wanted to jump in. Yes, although I, I Fiona has said a lot of what I, I had in mind as well. So perhaps just to with a meeting of minds, but perhaps just to add, um, I think uh, Michael Reid created or used a term rather that that was uh, we work with him a lot at Chatham House, so he, which which I think describes the new politics, which is anti incumbentism so basically that you know the tendency is really to vote for whoever was not in government because there is a perpetuated constant dissatisfaction uh, but perhaps to add two elements to that sort of discussion that I'm sure we all love about what is left what is right in Latin America and we all love to say no pink tide um, is um, I think COVID has really perplexed the situation because basically throughout during COVID, and this is not a Latin America phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. We've had welfare spending increase by whatever types of governments, you know, we've had handouts by the left and the right. So I think voters are not particularly um, thinking right now of, you know, that particular left candidate means a sort of leftist social policy and vice versa, because we've seen in Brazil, for example, handouts for right wing uh, government. So it, it's a bit, the situation has been a bit perplexed by COVID because there is essentially the COVID economic and fiscal policy, and it's kind of cross-cutting across the left and right. So, so I think that's that's confusing voters. But there was also a very interesting article in the Washington Post, uh, I think today, on on the generation of sort of millennial uh, leaders taking over, uh, very you know, winning various selections in Latin America, be it on their left or right. And in fact, you know, the fact that they don't represent anymore what we traditionally perceive as left or right, but rather these sort of issues of concern is more the way that they think about politics than, than, than ideology as, as we would define it in previous generations. And the last point on the regional politics, I think what's really important to remember is also, I find that the regional politics, the way they are now, which I would describe volatile based on everything we've discussed, and, you know, this constant change of governments has a very detrimental effect on regional cooperation. I think this needs to be mentioned because there's such a tradition of sort of presidentially led regional cooperation formats in the region, very ideologically formed uh, regional organizations and forms of cooperation. And that's all sort of gone down the drain now because there is no continuity and, and it really has harmed cooperation across the region, which is something very detrimental to, to it, in my opinion. Thank you, Elena. Um, we'll finish this section. Uh, John Price wanted to say, Eduardo, did you want to, or John, did you want Jonathan jump in on this section too after John Price? 
Uh, I think Eduardo should go first and uh, I'll, I'll uh, wrap up, but John, I think is uh, queued up next. Okay, yeah, John, please. Thanks. I'm actually working on an article right now that's global in perspective and Latin America provides plenty of examples, but around the world, voters, COVID being a time of crisis, in a time of crisis, voters and people in general um, put far less emphasis on ideology and far greater emphasis on uh, did they manage this crisis well? Did they keep us safe? Did they keep us economically active? Um, and I think the pragmatism of voters is, is rearing its head. And there's a real pattern between the countries that were perceived to have done a great job. So the first off the bat that was, you know, had high accolades was New Zealand, right? They, they kept their country safe. They kept their economy going. And the prime minister was reelected with a stronger majority. Uh, Canada is an example of a country that, compared to the states at least, kept itself safe. Um, but there was, uh, it was tough economically. There, those lockdowns were more severe than they were in the United States. And so the, the, the Trudeau government barely sort of eked by in a re-election. Latin America, by and large, uh, at least the big economies in Latin America, the governments, uh, if you want to blame the government for it, uh, failed tremendously. The highest infection rates in the world, the highest mortality rates in the world, and the worst economic displacement in the world, both in terms of total GDP loss and in terms of uh, distribution of income worsening. And, and so when voters had the opportunity to judge, um, the, the more harshly they judged their governments, the more likely they were to bring in sort of political unknowns. Um, the more, uh, less harshly they, they judged them, perhaps they brought in something more institutional. To me, Boric was successful because even though the content of some of his ideas was radical by Chilean standards, it was generally very palpable. He did have lots of support from respected voices of political past in, in Chile and others. And I think that, you know, compare that with a Castillo who, um, you know, was a, it was a very different political animal, really unknown political animal, but people were desperate in Peru, the worst economic dislocation of any country in the world because of COVID. So uh, I think you have to look around. I think that, um, yes, people uh, expect more out of their governments and have um, more appetite uh, for handouts, but it doesn't, like, as Fiona even said, it doesn't really matter um, or, 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 or pardon me, maybe it was Elena who said it, handouts were given out more plentifully by the right-wing Bolsonaro government than they were by the left-wing AMLO administration. So the point is that political victory has come to those who promise to help, um, who both criticize the existing government effectively and promise to help. And I think that um, it, it is a rejection of the, uh, uh, of the incumbent governments. Um, in as much as it's a judgment of how they manage COVID. And for most of Latin America, that is a negative judgment. Um, and I do, I, I understand the ideological explanation of moving to the left, but I think that you will find as we, as we continue this political cycle, that it really is about um, rejecting, on one hand, the party that was in government, and on the other hand, the degree to which they represent the establishment. And that's why Petro has, has got the best shot he's ever going to have to win the presidency is this election coming up. We'll get to that. Thanks. Thanks, John. And what though you want to jump in quickly and then Jonathan up for a quick comment. I'll just say something super quickly. I, I think one of the interesting things, which again parallels what's going on on questioning in economic models, the region, even before, and I think the world, even before the pandemic was already looking for a for more support from government. And, and we started seeing kind of the strongman Caudillo type leaders emerge and start winning elections uh, in many ways, uh, offering to protect the people who felt vulnerable. Uh, post pandemic, I think that movement is reinforcing. The, the question is, is this risk something we should take uh, as a given that it will lead to the same kind of problems that America had with Caudillos in the past? And I think the answer there is, is um, again, more complex and, and probably a little bit more optimistic than it was in the past. Uh, in, in the past, the Caudillo basically had no institutions and civil society breaks against it. And having a little bit of optimistic faith in humanity, I think even the Caudillos don't start planning to be horrible dictators when they get 
history after the fact tells them that there will be, is more a fact that they start uh, governing, they can solve problems, they start crossing lines because of their, say, the manner in which they govern, not respect the institutions. And as they cross lines, they feel they, they end up being trapping themselves into not being able to see power because once they see power, they, they, will, they will end up in a very uncomfortable hotel suite somewhere in prison. Um, uh, I, I think uh, something that in many countries in the region today is true is that even when we have seen caudillos emerge, the, the existence of civil society, the existence of autonomous institutions is stopping some of the baser tendencies in some of the countries. Uh, and again, uh, I think the region can be put almost in, in different tiers. There, I think there's countries where civil society and institutions have matured, even though the countries are very young as democracies. I remember in Mexico, democracy but I was basically born in the year 2000. After 20 years having the emergence of autonomous institutions and civil society that we've seen is, is encouraging. I think that's true in many countries. So I think the, the, the solution or the, 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 the answer to how seriously we should take the rise of the caudillos is much more nuanced and much more complex than it would have been in the 1970s. Good point, Eduardo. And Jonathan, why don't you finish us off here? Yeah, so um, just to, to echo um, Eduardo's point, I, I do think that, that, that things are different and I do think that um, even though we are in a bout of populism, which, by the way, is not a uniquely LATAM phenomenon, it's 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 everywhere. I think it's fair to say, uh, it just um, has its different idioms in different uh, um, political environments. Um, and I do think that the willingness of of political elites, given this high high um, highly anti incumbent instinct, to um, defer to institutions is actually um, a defense mechanism. So that, you know there is an autonomous central bank in, central, in, in Brazil. And I don't think that we can get into this later, but I don't think that's gonna get erased because like the, the wisdom that led to the formation of the Fed in 1913, it's like, I don't wanna deal with that. You know, <laughs> let's, let's, let's put this at arm's length. So I do think the institutionalization is an important slow moving trend, but nonetheless um, is a gradual positive trend in Latin America that we can't discount completely. Having said that, Populism, and to John's point of the left or the right, generally leads to one thing, and that's larger debt. And um, I was very interested to read just recently a report that was um, produced by the World Bank, a working paper, just uh, about a month and a half ago, which I, I, you know, I have not seen in a long time, which is a, um, a creed occur essentially about the potential for debt crises in emerging markets, particularly among um, uh, you know, a significant number of countries in Latin America. And, um, you know, I, I, in my career, um, it has been all about the story of the uh, de-risking of sovereigns in emerging markets, uh, you know, the increasing reserves and the replacement of external debt with local debt and all the, all the verities of why everything is going to be just fine. Well, there is a level of government debt for GDP that is unsustainable in the World Bank here is that's describing this debt um, process as a tsunami, um, I think has some relevance and particularly relevance given that we are in a stage where people want the handouts. They, they do want the salve of fiscal, of the fisc more generally. And um, I do think that we should begin to start thinking and distinguishing between countries that we think are sustainable fiscally and those that are not, because it's not just Argentina that, that may be the ones that are um, defaulting on, on debt. It may be a much wider group, even a group that, um, as is often the case, is not intending to, but circumstances take over. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, let's move to country by country analysis. Uh, and I'll go just go back to um, uh, start with Mexico. Eduardo, do you want to uh, start us off? You are mute, Eduardo. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I think the story in Mexico is currently very, very nuanced, a little bit like the panel has said. I think there's some sectors in the economy which are doing extraordinarily well. Uh, the, the emergence of fintechs, the manufacturing sector is doing very well. Uh, some sectors uh, are doing poorly because of, re of reasons which are completely, completely outside of the country's hands. The, the, the problems in tourism, for example. And then there's a, there's a, I think a structural of the elephant in the room, uh, which is um, as the country questions the model that has ruled it for the past 30 years, uh, once you go through a, a period of, of that's so long in which nobody has questioned the rules of the game for the economy, and then somebody arrives and says, 
there's going to be something different. You will always have companies that have built themselves to exist in a certain environment that will have to analyze what the new environment looks like, whether it's compatible with their long-term plans. And once they decide uh, how it affects them, they will have to decide whether they do, they do want to play in those new rules or whether they don't. I think at the moment, the, the drop we're seeing in investment in Mexico, which averaged 23% uh, of GDP from 2010 to 2018, and the drop we're seeing to the current levels closer to 19, uh, reflects not only the pandemic, uh, but, but this questioning, and this almost like soul searching by companies of how they want to participate in this different model. Uh, and I think the answer to, to whether we go back to 23 or we end up in something higher or smaller is an answer that has yet to be answered. Uh, and to some degree, I think it will be very sector-based. Uh, Mexico, as part of the regionalization of supply chains, is a natural partner for North America. So I think the manufacturing sector likely goes back to, to, to very strong investment. Uh, in the other sectors, I think the answers will be something that, uh, to some degree, the new government will have to, to provide with giving more clarity. What's the country's energy policy going forward? Is that going to be something compatible with companies' long-term plans? Uh, what's the property rights, all those things, as those questions be answered, uh, companies will, will decide uh, whether they retake the old levels of investment. And there's also another side, uh, which I think brings investment back up, which is, is something completely independent of government, which is the size of the economy. The Mexican economy, uh, just by demographic factors, if we assume zero in, uh, income growth over the next 20 years, going to create a new, a new economy size of Colombia. That's just what demographics will create. And that in itself, will bring investments uh, back up because just to keep your market share in an economy where the size is growing, uh, you will have companies invest again. So I think the, the kind of sequential growth rate of investment will improve a little bit. But the real big question here is, uh, there has to be clarity of what the model is going forward. And once that is uh, clear, we will see companies uh, basically give their answer to, to whether they like to play or not with their wallets. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, Jonathan, you want to have a comment on Mexico? No, that's okay. I, I think we should we should move forward. Okay. Um, anybody else on Mexico? Um, okay. Let's uh, let's move to. Uh, oh, great that you could come back, Fiona. Uh, welcome back. Um, let's move to uh, Colombia right now. Um, I'll exercise chair's prerogative and and make a few comments on the political situation in Colombia, which I've actually scripted, which is very, very unlike me, but in, in the way of trying to keep this to time allotment, um, please indulge me while I do this. And then we'll uh, turn to Fiona also to talk a little bit about Colombia. Um, so the first thing I wanna say uh, about Colombia is, is anyone who can tell you politically what's gonna happen in the elections this year is either the world's best clairvoyant or flat out huckster, or maybe a combina uh, combination of, the, of both. Um, but this, this uh, unpredictability in Colombia is, is not novel. It certainly isn't from four years ago. And I think it's a little bit instructive to, when I talk about the unpredictability and the reasons for that this year, to just step back four years ago to explain a little bit for the, for the basis uh, for, for the comments that I'm going to make. Four and a half years ago, uh, there was a, there a politician, Santos, vice president, held a number of portfolios for President Santos. Carmen Vargas Lleras was the prohibitive choice to win the presidency. There was, there was almost no point in even having an election because he was, he was going to win that election. Well, for a number of reasons, that didn't uh, happen. Uh, and then smart money four years ago, almost to the day when we ran this event, smart money was on Sergio Fajardo, the ex-governor of Antioquia and the ex-mayor of Medellin. Um, that didn't quite work out for a number of reasons, which we don't have enough time to get into um, at the moment. Now, at the same time, four years ago, there was a, a young guy relatively well known with an extremely thin resume, uh, certainly to assume any senior executive position, let alone the president's presidency of a very complex country like Colombia, to be the president and he had no political base of his own. He was polling in single digits. Um, and, and if I remember correctly, even not even high single digits. Um, and that guy, uh, Ivan Duque, went on to become elected president of Colombia. And the, the fact of the matter is the pundits at that time uh, were, uh, forgot 
to uh, calculate that the Centro Democratico and the right wing hadn't had their primary yet. And while it was, and, and, and Alvaro Uribe hadn't um, made the pronouncement of who he was anointing. And lo and behold, uh, he anointed Ivan Duque at the, before the primary and Duque almost overnight went from single digits to somewhere over 30% popularity. And that's how quickly it moved. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's, that's just to illustrate where we are um, now. The only thing that one could have predicted in 2018, given the dynamics of the country at the time, was that whoever Uribe anointed would likely, more than likely, make it to the second round. That, that I think, every bit of smart money would have, would have been on that. Uh, but that, who that would be and how that would happen was, was up in the air. Um, this time, things around coming around are still unpredictable, um, but maybe for a, a number of different reasons. And, and I want to just provide a, a few of them. Um, first is, is former prime minister, uh, for, former president Uribe's primacy has declined precipitously. Um, if certainly if polls are to believe, be believed, and they've been consistently indicating this, and the last one showed his popularity was at 25%. Um, and there are other factors in, in previous electoral results uh, in, in the interim that, that might support uh, this, this polling evidence, but that's generally assumed. Again, assume who knows what that means, but to be the case. Uh, and because of that, um, the hard right doesn't have a lock, to, certainly to even to get into the second round. Um, and, it's, it's, uh, and it's due to a number of reasons. Of course, I mentioned uh, President Uribe's the decline of, of his power or, or uh, influence, uh, but also because uh, President Duque, uh, his, um, his um, protege has maintained very low ratings in general and is across the spectrum is, is considered to be, uh, what can only be described at, at best as a feckless uh, president. Um, now this time around, Oscar Ivan Zuluaga, who was the, lost the presidency to Santos in Santos' second run, uh, is the is Uribe's uh, preferred choice. He will go to a primary uh, in March, or no, actually he is already the candidate, so he won't be going to a primary. He's polling extremely low. I mean, he's he's generally has had no traction, seemed to be sort of a retread from for former years, uh, and and he's and and the and the mood generally is people are sort of on the right are are trying to hug the center right. It's unclear what the center right is, um, but you know we'll we'll get into that in a second. Um, so because of all of these factors and, and others which I haven't mentioned, um, this has opened up a lot of space in the political spectrum, which is a good thing. Um, and most of the candidates all understand that they need to declare themselves centrists. Uh, again, what that really means, uh, in the case of some, is is unclear, and exactly where in the continuum. Of, of the centrist spectrum they sit, nobody really knows. Uh, but that, that center um, spectrum is essentially being occupied by two coalitions that have come together to go to the primaries on March 13th and decide who amongst them will be the candidate for that coalition, right? And a lot, a lot of this was generated by the fact that uh, people don't want quote extremes between Petro and what's considered to be the extreme right is, is, is whoever Uribe designates, although there are people further to the right even than Uribe, um, but their, their um, fortunes uh, aren't, uh, um, aren't as strong. And the center right group is, com is comprised mainly of former mayors, the mayor of Bogota, Peñalosa, the mayor of Barranquilla for many years, uh, Char, the mayor of uh, Medellin, uh, Federico Gutierrez, um, who all want to claim being part of the center, but it's unclear what their policies are. Um, and it's unclear that a presidency under any of them would mark a, a change in the status quo from what's been going on under President Duque for the last uh, three and a half years. Um, not all of them have, except for one, has publicly stated that they think President Duque did a good job, uh, and and they, none of them have really come come through with any concrete proposals to exactly show what they would do. So there's a lot of rhetoric around it, but 
nothing's really it's it's all dressed up there's there's nothing below it yet and it's clear that another one won't say anything that might upset the duque support um, uh, uribe supporters or or perceived to be uh, uribe's political base because they are still an important political base in colombia the the center left coalition the, the esperanza consists of several centers including juan, Ma, juan manuel galan who's the son of uh, whose father would was running for president was killed uh, which led to the presidency of Cesar Gaviria, and whose father was two of the um, immortal icons of Colombian politics who had been assassinated. One was Gaitan in the 40s, and then Galan in the late 80s, and he had been killed by uh, Pablo Escobar's clan. Uh, and so he, he's running on that. He's been a senator, relatively young guy. Um, there are others as well. Sergio Fajardo is in this, in this coalition as is Alejandro Gaviria, who had been a, a successful health minister under Santos and had been the dean of Los Andes University in, in Colombia, generally considered to be the best in Colombia, an intellectual uh, and, a, and, a, and a, a very elegant thinker and author of books and the like. Um, they, this coalition members have all put out position papers on where they stand on a number of issues. Alejandro Gaviria has gone as far to lay out a manifesto of 60 points. Of, of how he would govern. And these issues, which they more generally, more or less agree on everything, has to do with um, it, it closing the inequality gap, has to do with how to fight the drug war, the spring of, of glyphosate, the, the general uh, inequality in Colombian society. They're all uh, pro-private sector. Um, they're all extremely um, pro-environmental. There's some daylight between some of them, the, the furthest to the left in that coalition, um, Robledo has been around for many years, is a very popular senator, always garners the most votes or close to the most votes every election for Senate. Uh, and his, his position is, um, in, as opposed to the others in the coalition, is he's very uh, not enamored of, of free trade agreements and sort of the quote, the neoliberal model. Now that the others don't find faults in it and, and would pursue sort of um, drastic reforms or reforms to it. But he's been very much on the record as being more of a protectionist, if that's um, if that's the word that we could use. Um, so the fourth reason for unpredictability is that it's unclear how strong Paul Gustavo Petro has. Uh, he's he's in a coalition. Uh, they will go on on <laughs> on March 13th, but it's it's a it's preordained that he will be the candidate who will win in that. Um, but no one really knows yet, really, what his floor or his ceiling is. Um, there have been polls have been bouncing up and down. Um, in, some things would indicate one thing, some things might indicate another. Um, but one of the interesting things that's developed more recently is he started to make a lot of unholy alliances, uh, at least for, the, for those who would see um, uh, strong uh, further left positions in a certain way. The people that he's making alliances with, for example, um, the leader of a religious group that is strongly against LGBTQ, strongly against women rights, strongly against a whole lot of things uh, that that you know, Petro now uh, has traditionally said he stands for, and he's also making deals with opaque, very transactional politicians um, with um, with unclear positions on a lot of these, and it's just viewed to be as a sheer. Uh, grab for power as opposed to moving away from any real base of, of principles. He's disillusioned women uh, uh, on the way he's run his campaign and his selection uh, as he has with Afro descendants to the point where there's even um, conversations, uh, public conversations about a rupture within his coalition. Whether that will happen and how that might play out, nobody knows, but uh, the, the best analogy I can make is to how Petro is running his campaign and might be if he were elected president, and that's a big, big if, and um, we, nobody knows, is uh, think about AMLO in Mexico. And that's exactly the kind of coalition that AMLO tried to put together uh, and, and rather successfully. Uh, and then there's, there's another candidate who's polling relatively high at this point. Nobody's garnering a lot of percentage except for Petro because he's been in, at the game for a long time, but he's a former mayor of Bucaramanga, Rodolfo Hernandez, who's basically running as a, as a anti, uh, corruption, you know, populist, and, you know, you might liken him 
to the, the guy at every party that we're, ends up with the lampshade on his head. So it's, it's unclear, you know, where where he's going to go. But it, it, feeling is he doesn't have a lot of staying power. Um, I'll just finish with two things to watch. Um, watch the congressional and coalition primary election results on March 13th. That'll tell you a lot. Um, and we haven't, I haven't even talked about the congressional elections, which is which are critical as well. And the other thing I'll mention in, in closing, and, and this hasn't gotten any any coverage outside of Colombia, um, is there's a recall referendum coming up now for, and it was just approved, the signatures were validated for the current mayor of Medellin, uh, and um, is would fit into the category of very opaque, unclear what the motives are other than sheer power. Um, and is locked in a battle of, of trying to, um, some would say, destroy the economic base and, 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 and the large economic uh, sustainers, uh, not just in, in Colombia, but, but uh, not just in Medellin, but in Colombia. Uh, Petro has made an alliance with him. Uh, and it's, it's unclear uh, how that will end. Uh, the, the, the forces on the other side have been pushing the recall referendum. One is, is um, Alvaro Uribe and Centro Democrático, but in the strange fellows with Sergio Fajardo and all of the center left politicians have all um, come out strongly in, to a degree against um, what the mayor of Medellin is doing uh, at this point. Um, and so all I would say is that that referendum hasn't been uh, scheduled yet. The thought is it might be scheduled as well on March 13th. And the results of that would be, might offer a lot of clues as to why, might, what might happen in the first round of the presidential elections is clearly an attempt to try and smash some of um, the right wing stronghold um, in Antioquia, but you know, to a less degree, but certainly pronounced as well in Medellin. Uh, so that's that. Uh, Fiona, did you want to say a couple of things uh, about the economic prospects in Colombia? Yeah, sure. Just very quickly. I mean, one thing first on Colombian politics, I think, like if you take a 30,000 feet view or like a, a grand historical view, the issue in Colombia is that is that shift finally towards the left and how far it will go, whether it will go to the center or to the left in this sort of post FARC agreement environment in a country that has uh, had right wing or center right governments longer than I think any other government in Latin America. So I think that's like the big, the big issue. And the other thing I'd say on politics is, you know, a lot of people don't think the center has a chance, but you know, we think maybe they do, but what they need is unity. And I think probably charisma and maybe a catchy slogan, because the problem with any sort of candidate of the center is like, it doesn't like when you're talking about maybe something that sounds like it might represent the status quo or very sort of gradual incremental change. That's not really a vote getter in the current environment. So I think that's the issue for the center. But I think, you know, Considering all this and everything that Ken has said about this very complicated race, I think that what we can say is that's probably going to be dampening, at least in the very short term, the economic outlook and probably interrupting for a time what has been a rather sort of robust economic recovery. It was kind of slow to take off compared with some countries in Latin America, but actually really gathered pace and has been outpacing most other economies in, in Latin America in recent quarters. But if you dig deeper into the data, you see that it's, it's sort of the, the headline figure sort of masks some interesting trends. One is, and I might have talked about this before in Colombia, is that private consumption has been booming in Colombia, uh, you know, obviously bar the COVID year, and um, it's been growing much faster uh, than, than expected. And it looks as if that's related to the big influx of Venezuelan migrants. Um, into Colombia. And that's really, although, you know, they're working in the informal sector of the economy, that's really boosting private consumption. And that is continuing by the looks of it to be the case, like private consumption is well above pre-pandemic levels now. And surprisingly for an economic recovery and unlike most other countries in the region, um, fixed investment is actually um, really subdued. So um, so that, that seems to reflect that there's already concern about sort of the about political risk in Colombia and what the policy environment will look like going forward that's reflected in already weak levels of fixed investment and I think that's likely to get worse I mean and obviously it will get it will get worse in, particularly if Petro is elected so we'll find out at mid-year in the second round in June and what I would say is when we have these big shifts in government so in Brazil and Mexico in Argentina in 2019 what you always see is in 
uh, the the first quarter of that new, of that new government or of that election, there's always a big impact on investment and GDP. And then depending what policy actually is, you might see a recovery or you might see things continuing to, to get worse. So it really depends on what the policy environment looks like. But I think that we can say that in the short term, just because of that uncertainty effect, we're probably going to see some, some more sort of uh, at least temporary weakening of the Colombian economy. And the, the complication is that all of this is happening, just as, as we've talked about before, we've got US monetary normalization. And that's really complicated for Colombia because when you're in risk off mode, like a really handy thing for market watchers to look at is just the twin deficit. So how big is the fiscal deficit and how big is the current account deficit? And if you look in Latin America, apart from the real basket cases, one country that has a very high uh, twin deficits is Colombia, and so that really, you know, apart from the political risk, will put its currency under pressure. And as I think we said earlier, the currency has already been under a lot of pressure. It's already undervalued. But in this current context, there is more risk of even uh, further. I don't think it's necessarily a Petro victory is totally priced in. Uh, to the local currency. So I think we could see a little bit more turbulence and all of that means, of course, that uh, economic policy is that much harder to manage. So I think we're probably entering into uh, a slightly more complicated uh, phase uh, for the Colombian economy, at least temporarily. Thank you, Fiona. Um, so I guess we should move on to the next country. Um, why don't we move on to Peru? John, Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about Peru? Sure. Uh, you know, the story in Peru um, is constantly changing and yet nothing's really changed for the last eight or 10 years. And that there's a true dichotomy between the drama and the unpredictability of the political environment and the incredible, predictable and stable economic environment. And um, the economic environment, the stability of the economic environment, you have to go back to the Fujimori days when basically the entire country was sold in terms of energy concessions and mining concessions. If you look on a map as to which of the Peruvian territory has been set aside for either of those two industries, it's, it's about 80% of the country. And they also wrote um, by, by mimicking much of what the Chileans had done wrote one of the best mining codes in the world. And regardless of political change have basically backed up that mining code. And that has ushered in tremendous amounts of investment. And this is investment that once a mine is built and it's always a little tumultuous getting to that point, but once it starts extracting, it's pretty consistent dollar generating business. And Peru has had this fabulous, constantly growing export base built upon that commodity extraction. What that does is it provides a degree of certainty um, that allows the central bank to lower interest rates, that allows investors to feel comfortable about investing in uh, sole generating businesses. And so this has led to the massification of credit extension to the middle class, um, of loans to small business, sometimes through official channels like Scotiabank, other times through unofficial channels, but at increasingly competitive interest rates. And that is what has really built up the retail economy of Peru over the last 10 years. Now, the political noise in Peru stems from, it's the, you, can, you can cut a line across Peru between the affluent coastal populations and the rest of the country. And the affluent coastal populations have done well by globalization. They've done well by foreign direct investment. They've done well by the strong soul. The interior of the country, which is still highly disconnected in terms of infrastructure, where the productivity and income levels drop off like a cliff, those people have been left behind in the economic revolution of modern Peru. And they're the ones who have voted for change. Um, and we've seen this in previous elections and always the second round in Peru is a nail biter and it has been for the last three or four elections. But at the end of the day, whoever comes into power realizes that if you start messing with the economic certainty and really what is an underpinning of the whole economy, which is mining represents and to a lesser degree, the energy sector, they realize they're not, they shouldn't mess with it. So um, on the one hand, it's, it's very scary uh, to see just how immature the political rhetoric is from both left and right within Peru. 
It's also scary to see what appears to be just a very unscrupulous activity by politicians. They're constantly getting caught. You know, the latest one is Castile. They found $20,000 in his toilet. Um, and what's an interesting thing that people don't talk about in Peru, if you go back to the Fujimori days and Montesinos, who was, you know, his head of intelligence, Montesinos um, created, or the demand that he provided, created a, an, an incredible surveillance industry in Peru. Um, and he was surveilling everybody. I mean, politicians, business leaders, and of course, the targets of his wrath, which were the, the, um, the uh, shining path. But as Montesinos was, you know, as he lost his job and Fujimori was, was abandoned, that industry did not disappear. And so you have this industry of people who know how to surveil and the technology to do it. And every business, you know, there's an expression in Lima, if your phone is not being tapped, you're just not important. And basically every major business group and political group in Peru is constantly tapping the phone and surveilling their opponents. And so every political, um, significant political player in office has been caught with his hand in the cookie jar, not because the, the Peruvians are particularly unscrupulous, but because they're the most surveyed political class that we know of, at least in a democratic country. Um, and so this, this dysfunction uh, is going to continue for some time. But I wouldn't worry about the political antics of Peru. So long as the model of this underpinned mining economy and they don't mess with that, I wouldn't worry. Thanks, John. Uh, Eduardo, did you want to say a, sh a short comment about Peru? Sure, I'll say something very quickly. I think Peru in some ways is, a, is an interesting case study for LATAM. Yeah, I think an interesting thing about the world, when you look at countries which are uh, wealthy and which ones haven't gotten there, uh, it's interesting that basically the only two wealthy countries in the world which aren't uh, parliamentary are France, half, and, and the US. Uh, and I think this uh, reality of the uh, uh, parliamentary regimes uh, being the wealthier ones to some degree comes back to the capacity to create a consensus around the economic model, because to survive, you have to create a consensus uh, with different parties. And that also means that you waste a lot less resources as an economy kind of swinging from left to right. There's also the, the history that, uh, of, of countries uh, that are wealthier also having been uh, countries for longer and, and other factors, but I think that's one of them. In Peru's case, it, uh, almost by, by mistake, the, the government, the political dynamics in Peru are becoming a parliamentary regime in the sense that you have no parties uh, and to stay in power, uh, Peruvians say that the most dangerous job in the world is to be a Peruvian ex-president because basically all of them have bumped into some kind of problems. And, and, and to stay in power and survive an impeachment in Peru lately, you're basically becoming a, a parliamentary regime which constantly has uh, votes of confidence. Uh, whether they can create a political environment that's more stable without derailing the strengths that, that have made Peru the basically the strongest economic power in a, in a miracle in Latin America for the past 20 years will be key. Peru has done, there's a lot of people who speak about China and, and the commodity windfall being the driver of Peru. I think to some degree that's true, but there's two other factors which I think are even more important. The first one is, uh, is savings. The Peruvian contributions of workers into domestic savings are massive. They're about twice as, for example, Mexico and Colombia. That means that you accumulate a resource at a really fast pace in your domestic savings. Combined with a government that eats up very little of it because it's been fiscally very prudent, it means that your interest rates are structurally very low, which means the hurdle rates for investment in the country are very low, which means, uh, and to, to a large degree explains why Peru has outpaced the rest of Latin American growth. The other one is women. Uh, Peru in 1990 had a, about a 30% participation of women in the labor force, in the formal labor force. Women have always worked very hard, but now they're getting paid. Peru managed in 20 years to increase the participation of women into the formal labor force from 30% to 70%. That means uh, that meant uh, basically 20 percentage point addition uh, to the labor force, and it meant uh, half of the of the countries in the, uh, households in the country became two income households from being one income households in the past, which massively boosts income per capita. Uh, I think that the Peruvian example in many cases is something that the rest of Latin America should learn from, particularly in those two things, high saving rates and high women participation rates. Um, the question is, will the unstable political uh, dynamics break it or not? 
I'm actually optimistic on Peru uh, becoming a little bit of a Northern Italy, that they learn to live through political instability. <laughs> Thank you, Eduardo. Um, let's go to Brazil. Elena, did you, you want to start us off? Then we'll go to Jonathan. Yes, sure. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll try to be brief. I also sometimes have the feeling that everyone in the world is reading about Brazil because, you know, but the FT writes about it all the time. Uh, lots to look at uh, in 2022. Um, I think, uh, well, economically, I, I think there's others that are uh, that might speak to that. But just to say Brazil's going into 2022. Uh, with uh, with not the best economic outlook, inflation is the highest it's been in decades. Uh, unemployment is high, uh, and and with the uh, presidential election coming up in October, there is no view to any uh, spending cuts coming up. So 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 I first to say I think that we'll be looking at the economics a lot, also because economics have been have become the number one issue: economics and unemployment on the on the sort of. Um, uh, voter preferences uh, opinion poll. So really, uh, if one looks at what the Brazilians are voting based on its economy and employment, which is part of the economic management of the, the mismanagement of, of COVID, and then, you know, the classic, uh, classic triptych of, of sort of corruption, uh, public security, and, and sort of public um, social, social policies. Um, interestingly enough, very low on, on these opinion polls, the, the sort of preference for more or less democracy or more or less authoritarianism, uh, which, uh, which really doesn't come high up. And not surprisingly, actually, because if uh, we've been looking for, for some years now um, at the Latino barometer polls, which show that across Latin America, that's not a very salient factor anymore in voter preferences. I mean, the bigger thing to watch for, or rather the big, the main thing to watch for in 2022 is, of course, the election. Um, uh, what we're looking at right now is 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 basically the, the, the most likely scenario um, is a uh, an election that will be fought uh, between uh, the president uh, Jair Bolsonaro, uh, who is uh, who's obviously a, a far right president, uh, and most likely uh, going to a second round uh, with uh, Lula, uh, assuming uh, that that he's he's uh, he's running, he has the biggest support at the moment uh, from the Brazilian electorate. And then there is, of course, the the famous third way that uh, many are discussing. You know, will a a a non a, a sort of centrist candidate emerge as uh, having enough support to perhaps go into a second round? Uh, with with one of the two candidates, uh, and there is a few a few running of those running that seem to be um, harnessing quite significant support. Um, chief amongst them, Sergio Moro, uh, ex minister of justice under Bolsonaro, and of course, as everyone knows, uh, 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 the judge who who was in, who was the, the 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 chief investigator in the in the Lava Jato scandal. Uh, but uh, the, the the polls for for the moment seem to be. Uh, giving him good numbers, but nowhere near what Bolsonaro or 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 uh, Lula would be attaining, and then other centrist candidates such as um, Ciro Gomez, um, who is a sort of centre left candidate, uh, but uh, still not not getting near enough as the eleven percent that Moro has, uh, and and the governor of São Paulo, who is now won the primary for the PSDB, uh, but is really polling very low. In fact, of I, in spite of I would say rather rather um, successful uh, management of the COVID crisis in in São Paulo, which also uh, invested in in sort of the manufacturing development of the vaccine, uh, but I'd say that based a bit perhaps is tainted in itself, uh, as are most established parties, uh, to be honest. So what we're looking at is an election that will be fought amongst uh, the very polarizing candidates, probably uh, Lula and Bolsonaro. Uh, it's most analysts agree that actually those candidates do want to have the runoff between the two of them because it's there really in the polarizing dynamic that they can really get the most support that they want. A, a third way candidate would be much more likely to pull away support from either of the two candidates uh, and therefore jeopardize what they, they consider a secure electoral basis to begin with. Uh, so really, it's in their hope to prevent uh, a, a third candidate for, for gathering uh, substantial support. And, and I think we'll be looking at both of them trying to, to do that uh, in, in, in the run-up to, to October. And of course, what kind of means do they have to do that? Uh, 
from the Bolsonaro side, it's obviously um, the continuing uh, the, the handout policy that he implemented during the COVID times, which has really produced very beneficial results for his support. He's getting support from bases he didn't have before because of this, which is interesting. And, and he's really pushing in Congress to, to do so. And then one, one group that he's kind of lost at the moment is the group that voted for him because they wanted to... Um, to 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 sort of have the the more orthodox and open economic policies and an opening of the of the of the markets, which was prevented uh, because of COVID uh, to a degree. So the Paulo Guedes supporters and 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 to do that, I think uh, what he'll be doing is trying to move ahead in some significant privatizations that should go on, namely of the post office and Electrobras, um, and possibly uh, the, the the initiated reform uh, of the public sector, although the tax reform is not likely to go ahead. So these are kind of the Bolsonaro tools alongside the classic populist tools, which are, you know, um, the, the sort of discourse, the narrative, the disinformation and, 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 and etc. Um, and, and going back perhaps to get back to, to the narratives that attracted his base groups of support, so the evangelicals and, and the sort of gun gun lobbies, et cetera. From the Lula side, um, it's, 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 it's very much the anti-Bolsonaro narrative that is, that is going to be a, to, a way to, to push his, his popularity. Um, I also should say that Bolsonaro has now joined the party, which is part of the sort of central, the big part of the centrist uh, bloc in Congress, which has sort of going back on what he had initially started with in 2018, which is sort of staying out of that. And now he's in there. So it's changing a bit the way he's, he's approaching this. But for Lula, it will really be this narrative. And, and he's already doing it. He's using a lot the word Democrats should, Democratas should do this and that. And that's clearly creating a sort of juxtaposition. You know, Democratic forces should do this. and his opponent being considered not democratic. So in a way he's linking his election, his, his, his success or his victory to maintaining uh, so, so democracy in Brazil, which may be the case if we are to believe that perhaps a January 6th scenario uh, will take place if Bolsonaro loses. Bolsonaro has indeed suggested that that might happen, you know, the January 6th US uh, scenario. But uh, Lula has more recently shown, uh, there were a few doubts until December about what his agenda would be, because there's two types of Lula. There's Lula, the champion of workers, and then there's Lula, the president, who was really accommodating to the private sector as well and sort of found a middle way there. And, and there were some doubts until December about what his agenda should be. I, I would say that now we can look a bit to the people that he's been starting to work with and, and see that that he's planning to, to be indeed that pragmatic Lula. I mean, the suggestion to have Geraldo Alcmin as his vice president, I think, is one of those because he comes from the PSDB and, and he's a much more centrist, I would say, uh, vice president. And he brings with him also another type of votership. Um, and then he had, uh, he's just this week uh, released uh, or asked um, Guido Mantega to release a series of articles in Folha and he was his finance minister for, for a while, but he's, he's interesting. He's an interventionist, but he's also sort of an orthodox economist. So he, he really merges these two. Uh, so, so I think he's showing us that he would be that kind of president. And at the same time, he's really talking about, you know, re-reforming um, the labor labor laws, which were reformed uh, under Temer, so in 2017, uh, to really, in a way that 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 lowered salaries for workers. So, on, and Lula saying, no, we have to to have a new reform of of a labor regulation, which would help and favor workers. So, I think he's he's going with his worker party hat, and he's also going with the, I'm the president who brought Brazil to this way that brought foreign investors. Obviously, another time commodities boom, but I think he's, he's, that's the, the, the whole the game that is being played. And obviously um, he's, uh, and maybe that's my last point, um, very, Lula is very aware of what's going on in the world and he's very good at sussing out the geopolitical tendencies. And, and he's seen that now this US-China juxtaposition is also something that has to do with the juxtaposition between democratic forces and non-democratic forces. So he did his tour of Europe, to spoke about democracy. He's really getting um, those, those concerns about the erosion of democracy globally um, to become part of his narrative and, and thus getting support from all these actors, the United States, the Europeans, the Canadians, I imagine, major democracies. And let's not forget that there's a lot of financing for Brazil in terms of its environmental policy that is waiting to be given by the Norwegians, by the Germans, by the Americans, the moment we have signs of 
a more democratic, but also more pro-climate, pro-human rights, pro-indigenous rights government. So that's also a promise of something that could come. So we're looking at this election, uh, but obviously there's in Brazil, the time between now and October is, is massive. A lot can happen. So, you know, this is my forecast of now of what we'll be seeing, but obviously in a month from now it could change because it's Brazil. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elena. Jonathan, anything you wanted to add to that? Just a couple of brief comments. I mean, Elena covered the, the shoreline here um, very effectively. Um, the, the first is, I, I think that uh, the, the point she made around um, really the, the very low likelihood of there being a third wave, sort of a third wave candidate that could really capture the imagination. It's hard enough in Brazil um, anyway, and now with the nature of the political um, landscape that the Bolsonaro phenomenon has created, it, it seems very unlikely. And I would say that the the tapping, I don't think it's official yet, but the tapping of um, Alkmin uh, makes it even more difficult, frankly, coming from the PSTV. Um, the second point uh, I would make is, um, I, I think that we need, that we're all gonna get much more familiar uh, with the Central and, and, and how it behaves and what it's motivated by its incentives. You know, there was a very interesting period under Temer where it was really that block that was determining the, the future of policy. And frankly, the policy wasn't bad. Um, it was also under a lot of duress. Um, that duress, third point, is going up. So um, I'm, I, 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 don't, I don't know that my opinion is any different than really um, anyone's on the panel that we assume that Lula will um, abandon some discussion around large amounts of spending, killing the spending cap. But I think we have to separate between what is rhetoric and what is a reality. Um, what is rhetoric is he doesn't want to signal that he's uh, moved to the center too fast because he's got a lot of people to get in Bahia to vote for him. But, uh, or actually it's easy in Bahia, but in the South to vote for him. Um, and, but at the same time, when he gets into power, I think he's smart enough to know from having been president in a time of uh, some fiscal straits that um, they're probably gonna have to get rid of the cap in some manner or augment, or, or augment their ability to spend because they're um, they're between a rock and a hard place. So I think it'll be just tougher um, sledding uh, for for Lula president. The final thing I would say is, um, and I go back to the point that uh, Elena I think rightly raises around climate. Um, it is hard to uh, uh, to say or overstate the importance of Brazil to the climate question globally. Um, it, 2020 was the first year that the Amazon became a net contributor of carbon uh, to uh, the planet, which is a pretty astounding fact. And uh, it says a lot about, um, about the dynamics and how important that space is in, in terms of um, natural solutions uh, or part of natural solutions to the climate crisis. I think that um, Lula being as, as shrewd and as canny as he is, has been taking very copious notes from COP26 from a certain other very canny and shrewd person named uh, Mahendra Modi, um, who has played this question of climate and financing and being friends with the right people really quite exquisitely. And I think uh, my expectation is that Lula is going to turn um, greenness into another kind of green um, called US dollars, um, which I think could be a significant fill up to his ability to manage the fisc in, in the country. So um, I, I, I have memories of, um, of Lula number one uh, back in the Pelosi days. And um, I think I think he will have maybe to us investors um, a view that, um, gee, I kind of missed the days when it was a big reform emphasis and Geddes was there and we had a big you know privatization push, which is still the answer for Brazil. But I think in the end, um, it'll be more because it's so tough to run Brazil, not because he's pushing it to, to the far left. Thank you, Jonathan. Um... We're running tight on time, um, um, but we do want to cover Chile. Uh, you know, we, we've done a lot of programs on Chile, and we will continue to do some, but we, we can't not have this program given what's going on with Chile. So Fiona, can you, can you give us the highlights uh, for our listeners? Yeah, just, just very briefly on Chile. Um, when I think about Chile right now, I think about high how high expectations are and how difficult those expectations will be to meet because those expectations involve Chile essentially graduating to high income status and 
uh, successfully uh, implementing the just notoriously difficult task of um, emerging from the middle income trap. It's not it's not easy to do, and that's what voters want. They want to they want to become Germany, and it's not easy. It's not easy uh, to to become Germany. And this reminds me uh, Boric's position in just one small way. Bear with me here. Boric's position reminds me of AMLO, and that is this idea that expectations on Boric as they were on AMLO at the start of his presidency were extremely high. But I think in every other aspect, it's different, by which I mean that AMLO has had the benefit of the doubt for, for years now, despite not having been able to really address any of those structural problems uh, that allowed him to, to be elected. Um, and yet he still maintains sort of a pretty high level of personal popularity. If you look at Boric, the pressure is already on and he's not even in office. So there are recent opinion polls that show that his opinion poll ratings have fallen and they're at levels that are below the levels that Piñera and Bachelet had uh, at, at sort of the same, the same period just before they took office. So he hasn't been given a lot of the benefit for the doubt. And, and he has also, uh, as we're, we're, I'm sure we're all aware, sort of been facing actual ructions within the electoral coalition, which doesn't look like it's going to become a governing coalition. So the far left of that electoral coalition has already sort of moved away from Boric. And we saw that, for example, in the election of new leadership of the Constituent Assembly, which I think was last week or, or the week before. Um, so essentially we've seen we've seen a split already. Expectations are very high. And also, if you look at what happened in the congressional elections, we know that it's extremely uh, divided and there's an element of political polarization. Now, we know that Boric has, you know, presented himself as someone on firmly on the center left that is also very willing to negotiate. And hopefully that's what we'll see. We'll see a process of negotiation, cooperation and consensus in Congress to get things done. But I fear that what we actually are going to see is a lot of political tension, polarization and legislative gridlock. Lock. Um, and at the same time, the other sort of big issue that is actually going to be sort of really sort of um, in the, you know, at, at the forefront for the next nine months is that we're going to finally get to see a little bit more about what constitutional reform in Chile actually looks like. Because since we talked last time around, we don't actually know that much more about what the constitutional reform of presentation is, is going to be. So here is where we get to like the real business end of this process where over the course of the next few months, we'll finally get those proposals finalized and, and see what constitutional reform is gonna look like. And I actually remember that last year when we were talking about Chile, I mentioned that for me, like one of the big risks was that there would be a constitutional reform presented for the, the confirmatory referendum that doesn't actually uh, represent what a majority of, of the country wants from constitutional reform. And uh, although our baseline forecast is that constitutional reform will be passed, which would be a positive uh, for Chile, I think the risk is growing uh, that uh, in that mandatory vote on that uh, constitutional reform, bearing in mind that the Constituent Assembly does skew left, that we might come up with something that actually doesn't get passed. And that would be uh, pretty disastrous in my view, uh, because it would bring us back to square one and we'd see a very high level of social unrest. So I think those are sort of the big issues to watch in Chile. And I think, again, as I was saying with Colombia, I think there's an element of uncertainty that's going to hit the economy, which again, like we said, you know, at the beginning of the, when COVID struck that probably Chile, Colombia, and Peru would um, have the fastest growth rates if you looked one or two years out after the pandemic. And Chile certainly now at the moment is recovering well, but I think our Chile analysts are saying there's going to be at least one quarter of negative sequential GDP growth in um, 2022. Um, just reflecting all of this, uh, all of this sort of political uh, uncertainty. Fantastic, thank you, Fiona. As I, as I mentioned, we will continue doing a number of events on Chile, so we will flesh out a lot of those comments uh, and 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 uh, keep our uh, observation close to what's going on in that whole process. Um, I want to end on time, as I promised. We have five minutes left. So I'd like to ask each of the panelists to spend a minute or a little bit less to talk about one or two black swans they see coming up in 2022. Uh, and John, uh, Price, maybe we could, we could start with you. Black swan or two for 2022 in 50 seconds. <laughs> 
Well, if, if what we've seen of Omicron in South Africa and then Britain and now Europe and the States uh, holds true in Latin America, we will not see the political lockdowns in Latin America, even with super high infection rates. Um, but we will see supply chain um, interruptions in Latin America as, you know, just as the U.S. had to cancel flights because there wasn't enough pilots and stewards to, to man a flight. We're going to see that in across Latin America as people take one week, two weeks off. Um, uh, it's pretty astounding what's going on. I'm in Florida right now. And, you know, there's over a million new infections a day that we know about in the United States. So it's, it's very disruptive, but it's short lived. And I think after that, um, you know, there was an announcement in Spain yesterday that the Spanish government said, you know, Omicron is an endemic, it's not a pandemic, and therefore we're going to treat it like the flu. And that is, you know, I just arrived from Germany a few days ago, and that is, it's not the political consensus, but it is the scientific consensus. And I think it will become the political consensus. So I think we're going to have a very difficult first quarter in Latin America from the supply chain shock of infections. But after that, we're going to see a real um, sort of psychological shift in Latin America as people shed away their fears. There's still a lot of fearful people in Latin America, even though they're a lot closer to herd immunization than anywhere else in the world. When you walk down the street in Colombia, people still wear their masks outside. Um, and I think that psychological lifting uh, or, or easing is going to have an enormously positive impact, not to mention World Cup spending, which is always a plus, um, that I think that the retail side of the economy is going to actually outperform what most people uh, predict this year for that reason. Thank you. Thank you, John. Eduardo. I'll give two super quick ones. I think the first one is positive. I think the, the, the dynamics of the pandemic will mean that the countries that are currently quite depressed and seeing their tourism sectors of operating at 60, 70% are gonna get a, a huge boost from that sector. The second one is less optimistic. I, I think that some of the drivers of inflation have to do with a recomposition of spending. We have seen demand go towards goods. The, the goods demand re recover very quickly, and in most cases, is it, is pre is already surpassed pre pandemic levels. So I think we do have inflation being driven by demand side factors. Yeah, and when you look at the surveys of producers, I think we're going to have an, an inflation that is much stickier, much stickier than we expect. And in part, it will be it, it will be driven by inflation basket basically being wrong on what a, a consumer basket actually is today. But also because when we look at output gaps, us or something that is average for the economy, they're, they're again wrong, because we have seen demand recomposed towards sectors that have already seen their output levels and demand surpass pre-pandemic levels. So I think we're going to have much stickier inflation in, in Latin America than is currently expected. Thank you, Eduardo. Elena, your black swan. A um, black swan to me is a low probability, high impact. So um, I would say a third candidate uh, in Brazil who's really, you know, uh, brings with him potential to, or her, to win. Uh, and, and that could change a lot of things for Brazil. Um, and something that is, I think, high probability, but I think we have to keep in mind since we're looking at 2022, is that there's a US midterm. And it's possible that things will change in terms of, you know, U.S. Congress uh, constellations, and and I think that will have a huge impact uh, on the president, the U.S. president's ability to mobility, capacity, and and sort of speed uh, to deal with with the world, including Latin America. Thank you, Elena. Jonathan. Yeah, um, uh, I. Uh think that a, a, uh, there's two really. One is a doomsday uh, variant, uh, which there is a significant chance still of a both highly transmissible and lethal variant, which I think would change the game uh, about almost everything we're talking about right now. Um, second um, is a um, drought. So, um, you know, if, if circumstances had been slightly different, um, years ago, uh, Sao Paulo with its drought, I think actually the political implications would have been huge. So if you have a drought on the lines of what happened in Cape Town just a few years ago, and it just doesn't end fast enough as it did in Cape Town, thankfully, within maybe three days of causing the most significant water shortage in South African history. Um, if that is happening in Brazil, I think it would change the game also politically on the ground and uh, economically. So Jonathan, just to be clear, your number one black swan was Armageddon. Uh, well, I, 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 it's not Armageddon. It's it, it's uh, unfortunately still a 15 to 20 percent chance of occurring. So, <laughs> right. okay, thank you so much, Fiona. You have the honor of the last word. 
Okay, well, I think COVID is the ultimate black swan. So that's what I put down. I put COVID and I put what if supply chains don't unsnarl and what if we need more government support, which is particularly in uh, Jonathan's Armageddon scenario. And the other thing that I think in terms of the big risk to the global economy is China. So either financial crisis or real hit to China's economy from zero COVID. But I really think that um, drought is a good shout for Latin America. Thank you, Fiona. And, and just to end, I suppose ending this way is, um, uh, Elena reminds us all that, in fact, there is the movie that's come out, uh, Don't Look Up, which is, is, is essentially the scenario that some of us think, you know, could be a black swan. With that, I promise to end uh, exactly at four. It's one minute after four. Uh, thank you to the panelists. Uh, profuse thanks on in the name of the Canadian Council for the Americas. It was a very interesting conversation. The event will be posted on our website, ccacanada.com, as I say or I said at the top of the, uh, the event, uh, by tomorrow at some point. But we will see you all on January 20th for our next event. Uh, and thank you all for, for listening and being patient, being with us uh, low these two hours that we've been together. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good afternoon. <clears throat>